We're in 1 Kings chapter 12. One of the most amazing things about the human heart is the fact that when you see people taking consequences for their sinful actions and you just do the same thing. I mean, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. In history, we see this over and over again. When Napoleon invaded Russia, yeah, they, Russia's too big to conquer. The Russian forces just kept moving back till winter actually defeated Napoleon and he had to leave in disgrace. Yeah, well, it, well, it's just too big of a territory. Russia covers one-eighth of the surface of the land mass of the earth. And so Hitler turned around in World War II and did the exact same thing with the exact same results. <laughs> yeah, what's that? Uh, well, I'm talking about for, for one country, it covers one-eighth of the Earth's surface. Yeah, so, uh, so it, uh, of course, most of it's Siberia. <laughs> So, I mean, you're not talking about, people don't realize that Russia uh, only has about a third of the population in the United States. You know, so a lot of it's very rural, barren, yeah, tundra. And people don't realize this, they think Russia's sort of on par with us as latitude, but Moscow's on par with Alberta, Canada. So it's quite a bit further north than what we are. But anyway, I opened this up with that discussion is because Jeroboam sees exactly the um, punishment that God gave Solomon and he goes and not only does the same thing, he, he does worse. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing when you don't get it, you don't get it, right? And so we pick it up here at uh, 1 Kings chapter 12 and verse 25. And it says, Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim, in the mountains in, in, uh, of Ephraim, and dwelt there. And when he out from there and built uh, Penuel, and Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David if these people go up and offer sacrifices in the house of, Dave, house of the Lord in Jerusalem, then the heart uh, of this people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Therefore the king asked advice, made two calves of gold, and said to people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem, Hear your gods, O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And he set up one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Now, in this thing became a sin for the people, uh, went up to worship before the one as far as Dan. He made shrines on the high places and made priests from every class of people who were not the sons of Levi. Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the feast that was in Judah, and offered sacrifice on the altars. So he did at Bethel, sacrificing to calves that had been made. And, as Bethel, and at Bethel he installed priests of the high places which he had made. So he made offerings on the altar which he made at Bethel on the 15th day of the 8th month, in the month which he had devised in his own heart. And he ordained a feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altar and burnt incense. Wow. Jeroboam had been given 10 of the tribes, except for Judah and Benjamin. Uh, by God, he didn't earn them. He didn't inherit them. He did not conquer the area. He was actually a servant of Solomon. And so Ahijah, the uh, prophet, 
predicted that he would be king, that he'd be successful as king, and he was given this gift that the Lord turned over to him in the time of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. And he had assurance of God's support. So what more does he need? <laughs> well, that's what we ask about Solomon, right? What more did Solomon need? We do not know what Jeroboam's faith, faith was or why God chose him for this task. God not only chooses people for his purposes, but he also does not reveal to us why. <laughs> he doesn't tell us this is why I chose this guy. He obviously is not a great spiritual giant. <laughs> uh, but he was two things. First of all, he was like the people he was going to rule over. <laughs> and secondly, he was like Saul, a mighty man of valor, we're told. He was a great warrior. And so he knew, he knew of the punishment that God had placed on Solomon. The curse is placed on Solomon. He knew the history of Israel in the wilderness. He knew all that. Jeroboam had plenty of warning of God's wrath. Matter of fact, you know, it's that old saying that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And it's kind of absurd to think that if God punishes one person for a sin, that he wouldn't punish you if you did the same sin, right? And so, so it's a baffling scenario. Uh, we see he starts thinking he gets very insecure, so, so now wait a minute. Now, Rehoboam is rightfully the heir to the throne, and perhaps if people start going back to Jerusalem for the three feast days, and we had three of them, you had the Passover, the Pentecost, and Tabernacles, they might begin to think, well, why did we leave our master Rehoboam, and they might overthrow me and kill me and go back to being Rehoboam. Now, first of all, we see... He doesn't believe what God tells him, right? God had showed that it's exactly what happened. Happened is the fact he got the ten tribes. Secondly, he doesn't seem to have a great fear of the Lord here because he decides to devise things out of his own heart. As a matter of fact, you'll notice in the very last couple of verses, he says, they set all these things up according to his own hearts and his own desire. And so he was not with the Lord. Matter of fact, there's nowhere does it say that Jeroboam ever was a worshiper of the Lord. Maybe he went to the Acts, but and then the sins that he does here is this becomes a byword in Israel. He says, and he didn't this king did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam. And this king did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam. So Jeroboam establishes this worship. The baffling scenario, if Solomon could not escape the judgment of God, how would Jeroboam escape the judgment of God if he did the same thing? So now we have a brand new kingdom in the north. It splits off from Judah. This brand new kingdom in the north starts out as a pagan worshiping nation from the very start. Jeroboam sets up this pagan worship system. Notice there's no allusion to God. We will not see an allusion to God till the next chapter when the, when the prophet comes up from Judah. There's no prophet mentioned in the northern kingdom. Comes up from Judah and Jerobo it curses the altar that Jeroboam had set up and Jeroboam reaches out to grab the prophet and say, arrest this guy and his hand withers. And the only mention Jeroboam has is pray to the Lord your God <laughs> that my hand might be restored to me. Notice he doesn't say the Lord God or the Lord my God. He said the Lord what? Your God. But that's next week's sermon. <laughs> and so, so here we have, there's no allusion to God at all. He, he followed the sins of Israel in the wilderness. He sets up a golden calf. Now he knows the history when the Israelites set up the golden calf that the wrath of God came down on, that thousands of them died. They, 
they actually took the calf, ground it up, mixed it with water, and made him drink of the calf that they had made. He does the same thing. Not only does it do, does it once, he does it twice. Once in Bethel in the south, and one up in Dan in the north. So Jeroboam's sins are numerous at the beginning of his reign. Notice what he does. First of all, he sets up two golden calves, Dan and Bethel. Secondly, he tells Israel, oh, you don't need to go up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is too far for you. Now, Israel's a very small nation. <laughs> and they've been doing this for the last, uh, you know, 100 or so years since the time of David, right? They've been doing up there. And so this is too far. Matter of fact, I'm going to make it convenient. By the way, whenever worship is convenient, it's usually watered down. <laughs> and so we're going to make this convenient for you. We're, you can go either to the south in Bethel or you can go to the north in Dan and it'll just be a short trip and you do the same thing and you got golden calves there waiting for you. And then he makes this statement, the absurd statement. He just made these calves. And then he says, these are the gods that brought you out of the wilderness. Wait a minute, you just made them. <laughs> and now it's not only one God, but what? You got two, right? You got two calves now. And so, and by, by the way, the, lest you get the wrong impression, they did not believe that the golden calf was really a God, but they believe a God lived inside the golden calf. Now, the, the golden calf represented a God, and of course, it's the God of the land, God of Baal. Bell was represented by a bull, you know, and so so we have this, and so these are the ones that brought you out of Egypt. Now then he then he sets up a priesthood to work before these calves, and he didn't even pick Le Levites; he picked from any tribe, Issachar or, or Ephraim or or Dan or. Uh, Asher or Gad, any of these tribes would do. He just sets them up. And of course, uh, if you're going to worship an idol, you might as well get everybody involved. <laughs> so they set them up. Then on top of that, they had compound, he adds high places. Now the high places were usually places on hills or mountaintops where they had a grove, and then they would go and they'd do the worship, and quite often the most vile sins were done. There were orgies and drunken feasts and even child sacrifice in these places. And so he built these. By the way, that's, you're going to see that in, as we go through the kings in Judah, that uh, he did what the Lord said to but he didn't tear down the high places. He didn't tear down the high places. It wasn't until Hezekiah comes along that they knocked down the high places in the south. Then he, then he decides, okay, we got a parallel. Now, Satan loves to parallel Christianity. He loves to mimic. You know, if we have a holiday, they want to have it. So what happened to Christmas, right? <laughs> Christmas holiday turned to, to this giving day. Well, wait a minute. That's what, not what the whole idea of the holiday was. Look what I did to Easter, you know. And so on and on it goes. So he says, okay, the, the Israelite, the, the, uh, the, the, the Jews down south in Judah have a fifth feast day for tabernacles, the 15th day of the seventh month, which in their calendar is actually October. It uh, says, we're going to have one on the 15th day of the eighth month, a month later. You don't have to go down there. We're going to have a better celebration up here. And so we're going to make, now this is where the scripture says here, he set it up after the desires of his own heart. And so he invents this day, and he's, I'm going to make a parallel feast day. So what they do down south, we do up north. The way they sacrifice, we'll sacrifice just before a calf. Whatever. See, Satan loves a mimic. Matter of fact, that's exactly why it says in a very important passage in 2 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15, that Satan appears as a what? An angel of light. He doesn't appear as some dark evil figure. He appears and says, I'm doing I'm here to do some good. I'm here to do do some some you know something great. 
And so now he sacrificed at the altar at Bethel on this day, and he mimics everything that they were doing down the temple in Jerusalem. Now, there's several things I want to note here. First of all, there doesn't seem to be any protest by any Israelites. You notice that? There doesn't seem to be a mass. That we're not, no, no, we're going to worship the Lord. You see, the Israelites broke away from the southern kingdom because of economic reasons, right? And because they were burdened. It wasn't spiritual. And so they wanted better economic situations for their families. And so it seems that the spiritual matters were immaterial. As a matter of fact, we're going to see this as we get into Elijah, right? And Elijah having the same issues. So Jeroboam, without any protest, sets up these golden calves. He replaced the sin of Solomon, who sacrificed the many gods of his wives, who sacrificed the gods of the Canaanites. This is exactly what, in Jude, uh, Judges 2, that the angel of the Lord said, he said, listen, I'm going to leave some Canaanites in the land, and they're going to be a stumbling block to you because your heart's not with the Lord. And that's exactly what happens because their, now listen, their worship was more exciting. <laughs> it was more fleshly. You know, you can drink and you can get drunk and you can have an orgy and everything else. And, you know, so they worship the gods after their own heart. <laughs> By the way, almost all the gods of all the pagans are like that. Uh, the Greek gods, right? Uh, the Roman gods. They all were sinful and drunken and orgy. Our God is a what kind of holy God? It's a holy God. He expects us to behave in a different manner than the world. He expects us to walk in morality. He expects us to uphold righteousness. But here, there's no prophet in the north. We're going to see one come up from the south. It's kind of an interesting story. We're going to do it in two parts. Uh... There's no prophet in the northern kingdom. He took advice from evil men like himself. Uh, God will have to send a... By the way, this, we see this twice happening. Uh, actually, we see this four or five times happening where God sends a prophet from the south to the north. That was where Elijah was from. That was where Elisha was from. That was where... Uh, this uh, unnamed prophet in the 13th chapter here in 1 Kings was from. That's where Amos was from. In fact, Amos says, I wasn't a prophet nor a son of a prophet, right? He said he was from Tekoa, which was in the southwest of, the, of Judah. <laughs> and so, so he goes, he, he, you know, there's no prophet there. God will send one. Now when God sends this prophet to him, we're going to see he doesn't heed him. I mean, how, God proves over and over again his miracles. That happened in the time of Jesus, right? Jesus did miracle after miracle after miracle. And the people still didn't believe. And so, and they said he lived in Shechem. By the way, this, this, I, don't, I think this is not a good translation here. He didn't build Shechem. Shechem had been around for centuries. He built up Shechem. Uh, the word means he fortified it. In other words, he made it a fortified city. He, he, you know, he probably put walls around it and, and, and put uh, guard towers and these type of things that it didn't have. Ironically, Shechem was a place where you have Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim where the law was read. Remember when they first came you know, into the land and one side, half the tribes would be on, uh, of the Levites would be on one side, and a half on the other mountain, and the one would read the blessings of the law, the other would read the what? Cursings, if you disobeyed the law, and the people were in the amphitheater down underneath. When we were in Israel, we were in the amphitheater underneath. Unfortunately, it was on a Saturday, says we can't go up this mountain because there are Hasidic Jews living there, and they would stone the bus. 
and they can't go up this mountain because there are fundamentalist Muslims living there, and they would stone the bus. So we had to you know, stay you know, in the valley, you know, looking up at Gerizim and looking up at, at Mount Ebal. And so Shechem, and by the way, also Shechem was where the bones of, uh, of Joseph was buried. So there was spiritual significance of Shechem, and he decides to make his capital there. Later on, it's going to be moved to Samaria, uh, also called uh, Sabbat, and we'll talk about that later on. And so Shechem was a holy place. It's where the law was read when they first moved in land. It was also where the bones of, of uh, Jeremiah, I'm not Jeremiah, but of, uh, of Joseph were buried. Uh, now we've got two rebellious nations. You've got Judah in the south. You have Israel in the north. And God is going to work with these two separate nations, particularly through Elijah and Elisha. Elijah and Elisha are the second round of major miracles. You have three rounds. You have the miracles of the Exodus, right? Then you had the miracles during the time of Elijah and Elisha. Then you had the miracles of Jesus and the apostles. So you got three major periods of miracles in Elijah and Elisha trying to bring Israel back, and Israel refuses to come back. And so... So we have this, and Israel receives, Jeroboam receives, and Israel receives warning after warning after warning after warning. Yet men love what? Darkness rather than light. And to me, it's unexplainable. Um, just like the Marxism they're pushing down our country now, we're going to hurt you really bad so we can help you. you know? I mean, that doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's exactly how evil thinks. One of the greatest passages in Scripture, which is repeated several times, uh, Proverbs 1.8, the fear of the Lord is what? Begin the wisdom. And with no fear of the Lord is, there's no wisdom. And so Jeroboam, Jeroboam, despite all the warnings, goes down this path, the same path Solomon went down, and the reason why Solomon, well, he had a king to begin with is because of the punishment on Solomon, and he ends up doing exactly the same thing. Um, could God have chosen a righteous king? Could have, perhaps. But remember what did Samuel warn? That God's going to give a king after your what? Your own heart going to give you a king after your own heart and this is what he's going to do to you. And we see this with Jeroboam as well. Let's pray. We'll have a discussion. Heavenly Father, thank you Lord for this passage. We could learn, particularly learn that men quite often don't learn. (laughs) And Lord, we just pray Lord as we consider these things Lord that uh, our hearts will be softened to you Lord and that we will decide to follow you with our hearts, minds, and soul, Lord. For it's in Jesus' name we pray.